All right, everybody, uh, welcome into our live here. Glad to be with you all today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the key components of a nonprofit budget. And I want to make sure that uh, we cover all our bases here. Uh, before we get started, let's go ahead and do a quick introduction, and then we'll jump into our content today. Hey, everybody, this is Dr. William Clark, your host of the Dr. William Clark podcast. Glad to be with you all today. Wanted to welcome you into the podcast and just tell you thank you. Thank you for logging on, subscribing, watching, clicking, liking, sharing this podcast and the previous podcast episodes. It's our desire to provide great content for you, particularly if you are looking for content around nonprofit strategy, nonprofit leadership, and nonprofit fundraising. As you uh, engage in this particular podcast, I'm going to ask that you take a moment to not only take notes as we get started, but also take a moment to share this particular podcast episode with someone in your life who you believe can benefit from this. This could be a colleague. This can be a friend. This can be a partner. It could be a stakeholder. Anyone you think can benefit from good content around nonprofit stuff. With that being said, guys, let's go ahead and get into our show, and I'll see you guys on the other side. All right, everybody, this is Dr. William Clark again. Glad to have you with us. So let's go ahead and talk about this topic of uh, nonprofit budgets. What's going to go into it and why it really matters? And so this particular topic is relevant because uh, as many of you are looking to kick off the new year strong and to position your organizations uh, to capture funding from funders, they're going to be asking for your funding, uh, your budgets, and what's going to be the cost of operating your program. And so I want to make sure that you have all of that in your possession. So with that being said, I want to uh, talk about uh, the components of a budget and uh, why you should develop it uh, in a particular way. So Let's jump into uh, our topic here. Now, uh, there are a number of components that I want to share with you as it relates to our budget. And uh, let's see, there are about nine items here that are going to be important for you to consider for the budget. Uh, let me adjust my mic here, then we'll jump into those contents. All right, so we're all set up here. So there are about nine components here uh, that goes into a budget. Now, when you're developing this budget and when you're putting the budget together, it matters how you structure the budget because the funders that you're pursuing, particularly when you start to work with uh, funders uh, who are of a certain size, who have certain experiences, who come from uh, a deep history uh, of doing the work that you are looking or funding the work that you're looking to get funded for, uh, they know what goes into a solid budget. Well, number one, uh, they are influenced by best practices around the industry. So it's not just about your nonprofit organization, but they're influenced by best practices around the industry. They're influenced by best practices that are related to uh, the specific work that you're engaged in. And so at the end of the day, uh, the funders are much more uh, educated and much more in tune with the work than you might realize. And so when they look at a budget and they see that you're submitting a budget uh, for, let's say, a youth uh, mentoring program, youth workforce development program, a returning citizens program, a justice involved program, a, a women's program, et cetera, and you only have a budget for $5,000. What this says to the funder is that, one, you're a novice. Number two, you miscalculated the costs. Number three, they're likely going to waste their dollars. And of course, there might be other things that may pop up uh, on their radar when they think about, when they talk about the idea of, uh, of funding your organization. So you want to make sure uh, that you are uh, putting together a budget that makes the most sense uh, for their funding so that they know that their resources can be trusted and so that they know that they can count on you to deliver on services. So I want to go over a few things here uh, that will help you understand the components of a budget. And I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try to share my screen here. I just want to share uh, a specific part of the screen so that you can have this available to you uh, to frame out your understanding of what it means to 
I have a solid budget. So I'm going to focus on this particular part of the screen here that you see highlighted in front of you. And I'm going to share uh, just this portion because I want to highlight for you uh, specifically what you can expect and what you should be looking out for when it comes to framing out your budget. So if you take a look at the screen here, and I'm going to adjust this number accordingly uh, as we go over this, but take a look at this calculator here. And what you're looking at is a calculator that I've developed for my customers and my clients, I tend to provide these tools for members of the nonprofit fundraising masterclass. I also provide these tools for members or folks that decide to work with me uh, in a one-on-one -on -one coaching environment. But look at these components here. The first thing you got to account for in your budget has to be staff, right? Who's running your program and who's doing what? This also includes you, right? You are a staff member, particularly if you decide as the founder to be the, the kickoff uh, executive director or CEO or if you decide to just be on the board and not take a staff role because you have to choose one or the other and you decide to work with someone specifically and to bring them on, whether it's full-time, part-time, per diem, et cetera, you got to identify staff. And yesterday we did a live, we talked about the difference between volunteers and paid staff. And you want to make sure uh, that you're not uh, relying on a budget that has a bunch of zeros or a low amount for staff because you believe that your volunteers are going to kick in. Let me tell you, volunteers are wildly uh, unreliable when it comes to business operations. Also, just to be clear about this, your board cannot be viewed as volunteers that will do work inside the programs they may they are volunteers when it comes to policy when it comes to fundraising when it comes to uh general oversight but they are not volunteers when it comes to running your program so you got to be careful with how you view your board and you got to make sure you account for paying for staff and so look at this really really quickly right uh, we're looking at staff, and uh, we'll talk about the, the adjustments here in the standard here in a moment. Uh, but the second topic here, uh, and one of the things we got to also make sure we talk about staff, we got to include the fringe cost. So the fringe cost includes uh, taxes, insurance, uh, 401k, uh, days off, et cetera. And even when you're not able to afford that or pay for that, you want to make sure you calculate for that for a time to come and at least have those expenses set aside so that you're not caught off. Off guard. Now, the second uh, bucket here we have uh, includes program operations, supplies, etc. And so when we talk about program operations, we're talking about how much does it cost to operate the program. You may include additional support staff here, but you want to make sure you identify support staff in the staffing bucket. But program operations uh, talks about if we have to get supplies, if we have to buy particular items for our program. Uh, let, let's say you may be doing a youth STEM program where you're focusing on science, technology, uh, and math, and, and all this other stuff, right? Uh, and so you're going to need supplies to cover the cost of the program. Uh, you're going to need supplies to cover... Uh, what the students may be utilizing, what the teacher or the program mentor may need. Uh, you may be providing transportation if you're dealing with a certain age group for your population, your clients, et cetera. So everything that goes into operating the program, you want to have a budget here. Facilities, right? We're talking about your rent. If you're paying steady rent, you need to have a, a, a budget for that, as well as office supplies, internet, et cetera. Now, you notice I don't have utilities on this particular budget, and the reason is uh, utilities, uh, really, if you're renting an office space, it should be, in most cases, uh, covered in the rent in and of itself, so it should be a, a all-inclusive budget there for your facilities. If it's not, then you want to make sure you account for that. Marketing and branding. You want to make sure that you're covering expenses related to getting the word out about your program. What does it, what are we doing? How are we doing it, et cetera? I got to tell you, this is one of the areas where you can fall short and misspend money. A lot of folks think you got to spend a lot of money. And of course, there are people uh, who may have specific skill sets around marketing and branding where, they're, where their expenses are definitely qualified. And you definitely want to be able to use that money wisely. But when it comes to expenses outside of consultants, uh, which we do, uh, we'll cover here in a moment, and you're talking about, all right, hey, we're gonna, we got a program, so we're going to market on Facebook. That might not be the best use of dollars, right? Uh, we're going to print a thousand flowers and pass them out throughout the city. That might not be the best use of dollars. And so you want to make sure you're using your dollars wisely. And the last thing I'll say about marketing and branding 
is that it really comes down to understanding where your customer exists, where they spend the most time, where can you find them? And once you find that information, then you can go ahead uh, and spend money to market towards them. I hope this is making sense to you guys. All right, let's keep going here. Technology, apps, and hardware. Uh, you got to have your tech, guys. So we're talking about uh, software and hardware. Uh, you got to make sure your people have a tablet that's up to date, uh, no less than uh, a year old. What I mean by that, it came out last year. You want to make sure that you're competing from a technology standpoint. Nonprofits are typically known for uh, the uh, for asking for hand-me-down tech, which can be three, four, five, six, seven years old. And then by the time you get it, it really can't keep up with the demands of the program. So you want to make sure you have a new or newer uh, hardware, laptop, uh, tablet, cell phones, etc the apps you buy. Um, this speaks to a lot of the cloud-based apps that may impact your ability to run a solid program. So of course you're gonna need a, a solid CRM that's going to be responsive to your needs when it comes to managing client information. You may need a marketing app. You may need a survey app. You may need a calendar app. You may need an app for text messaging and mass communications, so on and so on and so on. But what I'm pointing out here is you don't wanna be cheap here. Now, of course, the budget you see on the screen is focused on $30,000. We're gonna adjust this in a moment and you're gonna see the number tick up uh, quite considerably. Uh, consultants, right? So obviously I'm a consultant and what we do, we help nonprofits raise money. We also help nonprofits develop strategic plans, do organization development, et cetera, leisure development, all that stuff. It costs money to bring on a consultant. And for those of you who are new to launching a nonprofit organization, for those of you uh, who are in the space where you're you're looking to uh, do something of substance with your nonprofit organization and you know you need help, you're going to have to have a budget for your uh, consultants so that you can cover those costs. All right. Uh, in addition to consultants, you want to make sure that you cover any other support that is relevant to the work. So what does that mean? So obviously you may need a fundraising coach. You may need a leadership coach. You may need a coach uh, and consultant for marketing and PR. You may need a consultant or support for IT, HR, et cetera. You may need a bunch of consultants for a lot of stuff that you might not bring in house for good reason because the budgets don't exist, uh, but you may want to bring an outsider in. So for those of you that are wondering like why why will we do this? Why does this make sense? Well, when you bring a consultant in, you're bringing in somebody who has experience, who's been doing this for a while. Uh, you're bringing in somebody who has uh, the, the repertoire, the tool set to make things happen. So think about uh, your house, right? You have a very specific uh, thing that happens in your house, plumbing, electrical, roofing, and you bring in a specialist to do those things. Now, there is a percentage of the population who may indeed be handy, but the reality is the majority of the population either isn't handy or doesn't have time to do those things. And so just like you would bring in a specialist to fix some things in your home, you want to bring in a specialist to fix some things in your nonprofit so that you can get it done faster. You can be more intentional. You can have more speed. You can be do it more efficiently. And consultants like myself and others that you may have come across, they have experiences that are relevant uh, to your work, and they can get things done much faster because of their experiences, because of their targeted uh, uh, skill set, and they can answer questions and save you time. They can save you years, decades, and in cases, months and days and weeks uh, that you would typically waste trying to do it yourself. So you want to make sure you can create a budget that accounts for that type of expense because it is a credible expense. Uh, you wanna make sure you create a space for profit if you're at this point. Now, we do recommend 10% uh, profit, uh, but it can vary. Uh, for those of you that are asking the question, wait a minute, I'm running a nonprofit. How can I have a profit? Well, a profit is not about monies that are being paid out to a specific person. Profits are monies that are being paid back into the business, the organization, so that there's sustainability there. You want to account for profits. And for those of you that don't know, a nonprofit uh, can have a profit. It's just that the profits are not paid out to individual individuals, owners, because a nonprofit does not have an owner. No one owns a nonprofit. It is a public entity. So you might want to bake in uh, profits so that you can give back to the organization. Lastly, most importantly, you want to cover uh, ad costs in here for admin. What are we talking about? So if you have admin costs like IT, HR, QA, et cetera, or you want to at least start the habit of accommodating for those costs, you want to make sure you have a budget for that. Typically, those positions 
are not uh, allowed expenses or at least large scale expenses in a, a grant budget. And so the best way to balance that out, number one, you got to cover your admin costs. Typically 10% is acceptable. Some funders may say, no, you can only charge 5%. Uh, that is something you got to work out with the funder. And it's different from funder to funder, but you want to charge as much as you can to it. The other way to work around it is if you're an HR person, QA person, IT person, or other admin person, um, they play a role in the program, and they also have part of their salary covered because they do programmatic oversight or programmatic contributions. The total uh, should be 100%, as you see here, uh, in what is this? This is uh, cell C11. Uh, this budget that we've been working with is focused on $30,000. So let's just make a adjustment here and just to see how these percentages are set. Now, these percentages are set based upon a particular client I was working with, and we were working through an example just to kind of see what it looks like and how it can work. So let's look at a budget for $100,000 and see how this works. Now, the way this calculator works is we've what I was dealing with this particular client, based upon their status and where they are in their journey and their life cycle, it made sense to look at or create these percentages because of what they were working on and what they were trying to accomplish. Notice they have zero money allocated to a consultant, zero money allocated to profit. It's their prerogative, right? But they have a lot of expenses when it comes to staff. These, the things in yellow here, the adjustable percentages will impact the dollar amount you see here in column B. But notice here in column uh, D, I provide a standard based upon uh, experiences I've seen, I've had, et cetera. And so you want to look at uh, uh, what the standard is, particularly if you join my, my masterclass, if you join me for coaching, we're going to work through the percentages that make sense for you. But look at this. When we put it in a calculator and the number we adjust the most is really the requested amount and this amount should be associated uh, with your overall budget now I want you to notice this really really quickly okay this uh, requested amount does not always equate to the programmatic budget it just equates to what you're asking for and what we're focused on when we adjust this number and I'm gonna mess around a little bit with uh, just the numbers no matter how much you're asking for from a funder you want to have discipline in how you budget funds for every dollar that comes in the door whether it's as little as five thousand dollars whether it's as large as five hundred thousand dollars Every dollar should have a purpose and be allocated to a specific place and outcome as it relates to your program so that when you're asking for $150,000, you know exactly where those funds are going, whether you're asking a funder for $10,000 because that's the largest award that they give for that particular funder. You know exactly where those funds are going and that you're showing commitment to certain things that matter, such as we are committed to having office space. We're committed to investing in our technology. Even though this is a smaller amount, we're committed. We're committed to our admin coverages, right? So for example, let's go back to $200,000. I'm gonna show you this, right? If you stay with your percentages, whatever your percentages are gonna be, you're always gonna find money. And when you start to string together funding from several funding sources, those dollar amounts for each category adds up and sometimes you may have overages per category which you can reallocate accordingly but you want to make sure you're covering the main cost and look at the technology piece i want to focus on this for a moment this is an area where a lot of people underspend and under commit etc but notice this every time you get a new grant award there's money going into the bucket for tech so when you hire new staff or you need to upgrade or whatever the case may be there's always a dollar amount for that particular category now it's important for you to understand this temp template that we worked through if you are in a situation where you want to work out your budget, you want to work out uh, understanding how to properly budget according to the grants you're pursuing, according to the organization uh, that you're developing or building or growing, I want to encourage you to join the nonprofit fundraising masterclass. Now, we have a special scholarship for members of the Blacks and Nonprofits group in Facebook. And if you're in the Facebook group, you can tack, take full advantage of that particular scholarship code. If you're listening to this particular podcast outside of the Facebook group, uh, you just follow the link by going to Dr. William P. Clark.com and click on apply to join our next cohort, the nonprofit fundraising masterclass. I'm encouraging you to join the masterclass so that you can take advantage of the help we provide in developing, helping you develop your master budget, whether it's for the organization, whether it's for the program, et cetera. With that being said, guys, appreciate the time. I'm going to play our outro. We see you guys on the other side in our next episode. See everybody. 
All right, everybody, this is Dr. William Clark again. Thanks for hanging out with us with this uh, during this particular podcast. And I hope uh, that you got some value out of this particular podcast. Now, uh, I want to make sure that we also uh, close this podcast with some additional value. Now, we've created the Nonprofit Fundraising Masterclass. This particular masterclass was designed by nonprofit leaders for nonprofit leaders to help you simplify your fundraising approaches without chasing funders. Now, if this is something that you want to engage in and utilize for your nonprofit organization, if you have been thinking about how to fundraise for your organization, you just don't know how to do it. If you're transitioning from one phase of fundraising to the next, or you're just trying to improve the fundraising capacity of your organization, then this particular masterclass may be the right fit for you. So if you want to submit your application and join our next cohort, then go to nonprofitfundingstrategies.com. Again, that's nonprofitfundingstrategies.com. For all others who want to just get on my calendar and chat a little bit about your nonprofit organization, we offer free consultations. So you can simply go to drwilliampclark.com to schedule your free consultation. Again, that's drwilliampclark.com for your free consultation. Guys, I hope that you've enjoyed this particular episode and we'll see you guys next time. See everybody.